spoilers? Oh, lots and lots of spoilers. Hey, you know that time when we were pelted with frogs? Oh, the fun we had. Well, this episode is going to go a little like that. Welcome to Max Mike Movies, the only podcast with a torrent of frogs. <laughs> and they're so tasty, too. By coincidence, we're smack in the middle of a series called Ancient History, the 90s, where we take a look at what turns out to be a really is a bit... I'm going to start again, shall I? <laughs> okay. Hold right, on, so, rented lips. Okay, do you want to stop recording and start again? Nah, 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 nah. Okay, just keep our, going? Our, okay. Yeah, I might not even, not even edit this part out. Who, who knows? Oh, Lord. Uh, yes, because we're live. <laughs> if, if we weren't live, could I do this? <laughs> right. So, mm. uh, by coincidence, ladies and germs, ha! Huh? We're uh. stuck in the middle of a series called Ancient History of the 90s, where we take a look at what turns out to be a really interesting decade for cinema. Mm. Who's we? Us! That's who! Hello! More specifically, that over there, sneaking fleece to wrap his feet, is Mighty Morphin Max Levine. And I... It's Morphin time! It isn't. And oh. I, I as the son of a gun whose work is never done, Nat 20, Mike Luce. This week, as if I need to say, we're looking at 1999's oddball movie, Magnolia. Didn't see it? Not at all surprised. <laughs> this movie might be number two on the I bet our listeners haven't seen this movie before list. Number one, still likely Captain Nemo in the Underwater City. <laughs> <laughs> before this opening sinks my career, let's do that business we do so well. So, you want to find us on the podcast streaming app of your choice? Hey, Why? Max Mike Movies. I mean, yes, yes, you would. <laughs> Who wouldn't? Uh, Bumpy. Uh, <laughs> do you want to find us on social media? Guess again. Okay, we are on social media. It's Max Mike Movies. You want to email us. Email us your comments, questions, suggestions, uh, all of the... Horse the... cooking recipes. <laughs> hey, we are not cooking Bumpy. Deep fried Bumpy. pony. <laughs> no, no. Pony Bumpy's jerky. our mascot. <laughs> Learn to love the Bumpy. I will, with a nice sauce and some like, fava you know... beans. <laughs> Uh, although there is something here in the Midwest called bumpy cake, but we'll uh, we, we don't talk about that. It upsets him. So my new favorite food. <laughs> so email us, especially after last week's uh, or not last week's our uh, six weeks ago episode about Star Wars, because I know you got stuff to say about that. Oh boy. Uh, email us at us us at maxmikemovies dot com. And hey, speaking of dot com. All of our episodes, including all three hours of episode 100, oh are available for free, no deposit necessary, no return, at maxmikemovies.com. Get kids, get your parents' permission. <laughs> Some parts may be made of chicken. <laughs> Sorry, <Right>. Tennessee. <laughs> Super fun ball. Do not taunt to a happy fun ball. <laughs> right. Uh, this week, Magnolia. The show. A film that I know Max saw 50 times when it came out. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first trivia. No, in uh -huh. fact, I know that you, in fact, had not seen it when it came out. Because I, I forced you. I mean, suggested you. That is right. I think I watched it on video with you. Yeah, right, right. Budget, $37 million. Mm. Take, $48.5 million. <laughs> oops. Yeah, oops. So Claudia, she is she plays the daughter of talk show host Jimmy Gator. Uh, she is the central brother, character, brother of Wally. No, no. <laughs> I'm sure he was in there somewhere. No, uh, <laughs> she is a central character in that she was the first created, and then the movie was then created around her. Interestingly huh. enough, because she her part is not huge. No, the weird suicide murder story at the beginning of the film was an urban legend. Yeah. Was not real. Uh, so the idea is out real quickly. If you haven't seen the film, and I'm guessing that is everybody, there is a young man, a teenager who lives in a very toxic environment. His parents are constantly fighting. Strangely, one of the ways that they uh, end their fights is the mother threatens the father with a shotgun, supposedly not loaded, uh, and this somehow ends the fight. He can't stand it anymore, so he decides to jump from the roof of a very suspiciously familiar-looking apartment building. For those of you who have seen It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, I'm pretty yeah. sure it's that building. 
Uh, he jumps off with a note in his pocket. As he is falling past the family's apartment window, it turns out that he has, unbeknownst to the parents, loaded said shotgun. The mother takes aim more or less at the father, but instead shoots him through the open window. As he oh. falls by. As he falls by in the stomach. Also, as it turns out, that day there was going to be window washers and a safety net had been set up at the bottom of the building so that he, in fact, would have lived would it not, were it not for the fact that the shotgun had been loaded by him. But that was a urban legend. It wasn't just There's an urban a- legend, actually. It's a, uh, it was a hypothetical situation that uh, they used in a law school and now they use all the time about... Right. Uh, was a causality or, or nature of guilt, right? Um, the the idea of the 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 coincidence is sort of central to the the story of this film, which is why they oh, use. Oh boy, it. is it! Yeah. Uh, there's also a story about a scuba diver played surprisingly by <laughs> Patton Oswalt, who I'd utterly forgotten was in this movie. So did I. I was stunned. Um, and I think this was before he was Patton Oswalt. I think he was somebody else. Um, but uh, a scuba diver in a lake somewhere in uh, California who was scooped up by a firefighting plane only to be dropped into the top of a tree at said fire and found dead there. Uh, this was actually later debunked on the Mythbusters. Yeah, there was that actually was also no an way- urban legend. Yeah. The frog thing. There is a frog thing, and we'll be getting to that. And you'll find out what frog thing means um, actually does occur. Yeah. And one of the stars of this movie had actually experienced it. Uh, oh. The guy who played Jimmy Gator had actually... It's like, oh, yeah, this happened to me in Italy. It's like, oh, really? Um, the most recent one, at least at the time of the trivia, was 1997, and it happened in Mexico. <laughs> this is the last major performance by Jason Robards, a very mm. well-respected actor. I specifically remember liking him and Jonathan Price in Something Wicked This Way Comes. Yep, he is Oscar uh, winner Jason Robards. Yes, his career is very long and very distinguished, uh, a very well-respected actor. Uh, Sadly, he would die of lung cancer a year after the shooting of this, which is interesting because during the film, he's dying of brain and lung cancer. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Large parts of this movie were inspired by the music of Amy Mann, not the other way around. So Mm. most of the songs in this film are actually hers, or or some of them that aren't hers are performed by her. Mm Mm-hmm. Leaping way back to our show's episode one, (laughs) Paul Thomas Anderson, the director of this film, was on the set of Eyes Wide Shut to talk to Tom Cruise, because Tom Cruise, who had seen um, Paul Thomas Anderson's previous film, Boogie Nights, really wanted to work with him. And so he showed up on Eyes Wide Shut and said, yeah, um, this character I'm playing is really repressed and doesn't get to do or show anything. I want to do something where I get to show something and do something, and we'll get to that. Um, he does that in spades. Yes, he does. The 877 number in the movie that's used to take the color to a recording of Tom Cruise making his character's horrible sales pitch was real and would actually take you to a recording of Tom Cruise making his terrible <laughs> uh, sales pitch until the number was shut down. So. Yeah. Boogie Nights, as I said, was Tom uh, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's previous film, made enough money that New Line gave him carte blanche in the making of this one, a, a decision they would later regret, <laughs> uh, figuring quite smartly that he was never going to get this again. He ran with it, which is why the film cost $37 million and has one hell of a cast. Yeah. Uh, one of the fa- uh, d- famous directors who calls this one of his famous films, favorite films, Ingmar Bergman. Yeah, I could see that. It's depressing enough. Oh, stop. Hey, no one's playing chess. <laughs> uh, so, the title of the film, a lot of people, I would say all the people who see this film <laughs> might wonder, why is this film called Magnolia? Now, there's a yeah, number I of did. reasons for this. Uh, it takes place on or near Magnolia Avenue, so most of the locations are on the same street. But it's also a termed term coined by Charles Fort, a man who is, did a big study in coincidental quote-unquote science, um, which he, and he's quoted a lot in this film, and actually one of his books appears in the background of the film. It's also, it's, so he came up with this term, and that's meant to refer to the region from where weird stuff falls from the sky, such as frogs. <laughs> <laughs> um, Manolia Petroleum is also the original name of Mobile Oil, which is a gas Mm -hmm. station that they stop at later in the film. And Magnolia images appear all throughout the film, which I actually didn't notice, but I take their word for it. One of the people in this film is a uh, character actor, most notable from the 60s and 70s, named Henry Gibson. Ah, yes. Do you know his character's name in this? 
I saw it in the credits. I don't understand why they did that, but yeah, his name's either. Thurston Howell. Yes, it is. <laughs> I don't either. It's never yeah. mentioned in the movie, but there you go. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so Tom Cruise, as I said, we'll be talking about him, improvised all of the final dialogue he has over the bed of his dying father, played by Jason Robards. Oh, wow. Yeah. The director, who accepted that the lines as written didn't work for Cruz, told him to reach into his own recent experience with his own father dying to feed the performance. Oh, wow. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. Philip Seymour Hoffman, in the background, is also reacting naturally as he did not expect that Cruz would reach so deeply for this role. Oof. And we will be talking about Tom Cruise. Max, this is going to be your favorite bit of trivia. 7,900 rubber frogs were made for this movie. And the ones hey, that are hey, moving, hey, I counted. There was 7,764. Uh, some of them were in the uh, fire grate. Some of them were in the... <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. And the frogs that are moving, those yeah. are CGI from our friends at ILM. Yes, ILM was used for this movie. I- ILM was used for digital frogs. Sure, yep. why not? Yep. So... There are lots of uses of the numbers 8 and 2 in this movie. This refers to Exodus 8-2, which states, yep. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. Or, yes. depending on your Bible, it's there's different words to it's that the, effect. It's God speaking of the second of, second of the ten Egyptian plagues, yeah. Right, the one that they couldn't afford for the Ten of Commandments. But, uh, <laughs> while Anderson, although they did the flaming hail, which I was... yeah. yeah. While Anderson had already decided to use the frogs, he didn't know of this biblical reference. Actually, Henry Gibson told him about it. Once oh. he learned about it, he peppered the movie with references to those two numbers. Uh, Tom Cruise was nominated for an Oscar and a Golden Globe for this movie. He won the Golden Globe. Amy Mann was nominated for an Oscar for Best Song. We will not talk about who won and for what. Won and for what? You know. Uh, oh. Oh. Oh, was yes. that Phil Collins' year? Yes, it, I said we wouldn't talk about it. Ah, you're that's make, right. You're Phil making Bobby Collins angry. And Tarzan, yeah. Ugh. <laughs> but of course, who else could have won that year that would have been better? Matt, Matt Parker and Trey Stone. Yes, they could. For what they song? They could have for, Blame Canada. Yep. Um, yep. Paul Thomas Anderson was nominated for Best Original Screenplay. Hmm. So, considering the film did not do very well, it was actually uh, a darling of a lot of critics. Not all of them, but a darling of a lot of them. Uh, there's probably lots more trivia. You know, who else could have been in this film? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, George C. Scott was originally approached for the Jason yeah, Robards. I, I, I role, heard he but, kind of was very emphatic in his no. Yeah. Uh, almost as much as Marcel Marceau in Mel Brooks' silent movie. <laughs> Ooh, there's a deep dig. Uh-huh. There's only one word spoken in that entire film, and it was spoken by a mime. Right. I so, don't like memes. The other reason I left France. So, uh, when I sat down to attempt to write out the plot of this film... Oh, boy. I failed. Yeah. (laughs) Here's basically what's going on. There is a large group of characters in California. And they all have their own stories. One of them is a cop. One of them is the drug-addled daughter of a famous game show host. One of them is a child prodigy who was on this game show called What Do Kids Know? Uh, One of them is a past child prodigy who is now, I'm guessing, in his 40s and has never gotten over the fact that his parents stole the money he made from that show and no longer considers himself smart. Uh, We have uh, just we have a a (laughs) guru who is trying to promote (sighs) toxic masculinity. (laughs) We have uh, his father, who was not the best person in the world, who is dying of cancer. We have his caregiver. And somehow, all of these characters' stories intertwine. And at one moment, they are all very much connected. And then there's literally, out of nowhere... Two hours and 20 minutes in. (laughs) A plague of frogs that dumps itself on Southern California. Well, Los Angeles, anyway. Yeah, That's Uh, right. Out of nowhere, it's raining frogs. Hallelujah. Yes. It's also called Kermit Syndrome. I don't think it is. <laughs> I'm du- I read it somewhere. Don't dispute me. <laughs> Bumpy disputes you. Um, Bumpy's going to get cooked. And in a moment that is taken different ways by the different characters, their paths either continue the way they were going, or there is a moment of change. And with that, the film ends. 
Honestly, describing of the plot of this film really will not help you. <laughs> no, um, it's ba- it's basically an anth- it's it's an anthology movie. It's similar to a yes. lot of movies like romantic ones like Love Actually, where it's just a whole bunch of interconnected uh, character stories. Yes, I'm not sure if there's a common theme. I think redemption is part of it. I think forgiveness is part of it, and I think the unforgivableness is part of it too. Yeah, and we'll get to that mm. right now. down <laughs> so first thing i want to talk about is the cast oh oh wow. is there a cast this wow. is a great cast so ricky j for those of you who don't know ricky j was not a well-known actor mm. but he was, he was in a bunch of stuff he is and he's very well liked by a lot of interesting people he was a very close friend of penn and teller he was a very amazing a magician himself yeah he uh, was an expert he was one of the greatest expert at card tricks of the 20th century he could throw a card into more things from further distances than anybody. I saw he, him live. I saw him throw a card into a watermelon. Yeah. He is exceedingly smart. He's like one of those those scary genius people. Mm. Uh, there was a great documentary on. Look him up. Ricky Jay is really interesting. He's the uh, narrator also. Yes, he is. Uh, as we pointed out, much to both of our surprise, although we both had seen the film before, Pat Oswalt's in this briefly. Yeah, for about a minute. <laughs> Tom Cruise. Yeah. Now, I am not a fan of Tom Cruise, mostly because pretty much every film Tom Cruise makes, Tom Cruise saves the universe, and I'm tired of it. Earlier in his career, he would allow himself to do some interesting things, briefly. Mm. Um, and this film is one of them. And I will go out on a limb right now and say this is the best performance that Tom Cruise ever gave. I think that is, I think you could make that argument. I haven't seen every one of his. I haven't seen, I don't know which ones he's the most proud of, although I know he's really proud of this one. Mm. But he does a, it's a spectacular job. The character is so utterly loathsome and yet human. Yes, very you, human. Yeah. It's actually got depth, and it's an interesting character. And it's Tom Cruise, so believe that, okay? I want, I want to get back to that character, but let's talk about the yeah. rest of the cast. I mean, William H. Lord. Macy, Oscar-winning oh. William H. Macy, who plays smart, uh, was it? Don, uh, so quiz Kid Donnie Smith. That's how, so, Whiz Kid Donnie Smith, which is how he introduces himself. Yep, he is somebody who never got past that one success of childhood. He just never did. And, and as he, it turns he, out, he's also closeted. He's a closeted gay man. And yeah. he's fallen in love with this bartender. And it is so sad because it is so understandable that this is bartender who's out. When you see him, it's like, oh, he's straight. But he's not seeing that. He's just seeing a very attractive young man that he has a thing for who's, for whatever reason, wearing braces. And so he decides that if he's like him, if he wears braces, maybe he'll love him too. Mm-hmm. And it is it's really sad. It's heartbreaking. But it's totally understandable. And of course, it's William H. Macy, so of course he's good. Yeah. Philip yeah. Seymour Hoffman. Oh, the Hoff. The only thing I'll say is that his part is not huge, but it is vital. And you've yeah. got, he's playing a caregiver in, a, in hospice, right? So this is home hospice care. And he's doing something that he knows he shouldn't do. And he's getting emotionally involved with his patient. Mm. And but the pa- go ahead. The little things he does are so wonderful. Jason Robar, or excuse me, Earl Earl Partridge, like he's begging for a cigarette, and right away, without hesitation, Hoffman reaches over and grabs a pack of cigarettes. And my first thought is, he's on oxygen. Yeah. What are you doing? And he puts a cigarette in his hand, and then he holds his hand down and he makes this sound. Like he's pre- he's pretending to light it, yeah. Because he knows you know Robart can't even get the cigarette to his mouth, and he the way he does it is so practiced and so like oh this is a ritual they do all the time. Yep. And and then so well done, so little, but it's perfect. And the thing is, is that this is a great actor who knows when to get out of the way. Yeah. This is not an oct- actor who's like. I'm better than this. My part should be bigger, better, bigger. I should have more to do. It's like, no, we need somebody really good to be between Tom Cruise in the role of his career and Jason Robards, who's quite honestly doing an amazingly good job for somebody yeah. who has to lie in bed and die. In what was effectively um, the last role of his career. Yeah. And it's, he, he does great. He, I, I mean, Philip Seymour Hoffman, we lost way too soon. Uh, I liked him in everything yeah. I saw. He was also in Boogie Nights. He um, was a, he was a real loss. Yep. He, was a, he was a great actor. 
Jason Robards, who you get mm. moments of where you realize how much he's actually acting and not just being an old man in a bed. Mm -hmm. Because he has moments of clarity. And when he comes to, when it's him being Earl Partridge, the father of Tom Cruise's character, it's like, no, he's all there. And then later on, he is just vague, and he falls out, and he starts swearing. And you can see that Philip Seymour Hoffman's character has been through this, and he know it, knows it doesn't mean anything, and he doesn't take it personally. So it's it's a small part, but it's not just an old man being an old man. It's somebody no, who's actually still acting. And Julianne Moore, who happened and, to be next on my list. <laughs> yeah. It, oh. Okay. Okay. I have. I think Julianne Moore is amazing, and not just because she's so friggin' stunning, but she is so good in this as just somebody who is wound so tight. You can yep. see her start the the thread unraveling. Yeah. She's she does an amazing performance. She is a much younger wife to this character Earl Partridge who's dying. Mm -hmm. And what we find out that one of the shows first we see her being really upset that he's dying. And then we find out that that's not all there is to it. Turns out that she married him for his money and she never cared for him and she used to sleep around. And then when he was terminally ill, she realized that actually she did love him and she feels horrible and tries to even get the lawyer, oh, played by so Michael Murphy, who was actually in an earlier episode of ours, What's Up, Doc, um, to right. take oh, her out of the will. that scene where he, she's, first off, she's whacked out on about 11 different medications. Right. And she's screaming at him, demanding that he change the guy's will and take her out of it because she doesn't deserve anything. Right. And that, and you can see that that's what's wound her up is she realizes what a horrible person she is, and she wants to somehow that she thinks make, she is, yeah. yeah, and she wants to somehow make amends for it before he dies. Um, it is, it. I mean, there's no bad performance in this film, and there's some really astounding ones. Yeah. Um, Alfred Molina shows up briefly, yes, um, Solomon, playing Solomon Solomon, Solomon <laughs> uh, the owner of this this electronics furniture basically house that's supposed going to be out of business. It's, it's kind of always supposed going to be, out of business. You're kind of supposed to be crazy Eddie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't write down her name, and I feel terrible for that, but the mother from Close Encounters of the Third Kind, uh, she plays the wife of Jimmy Gator. Um, it's oh, not fair because she, uh, yeah. I can't remember her name. She, she is a good actress, too, and she has a small part, but she's really good in it. And Jimmy Gator, who is this guy who's been doing this show for decades called What Do Kids Know, but, yeah, finds just, that... Mm -hmm. That he finds out that he too is starting to die from cancer and decides to confess to his wife. It's like, yeah, it turns out I haven't been all that faithful. And she was willing to look past a lot of stuff. And then she finally asks the big question, which is, why doesn't our daughter talk to you? That's Claudia. Yep. And he won't, he's like, I don't know, I don't know. It's like, you know. And we find out why Claudia is so messed up because apparently he abused her when she yeah, was young. He, mo he molested her. Or, yeah, and the so worst part. See that th there's a really interesting. I know we're getting away from the cast and more into the story, okay. but there's a really interesting parallel there. You have these two old men mm -hmm. who are sick and dying. You have Earl Partridge and you have Jimmy Gator, and Earl, his great regret is you know well he cheated on his wife all the yep. time and he abandoned her when she was dying of cancer and left her with alone with her 14 year old son who is Tom Cruise's character. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, actual name Jack, but he changed his name to right. Frank. And as he says, his. And uh, then you have Jimmy Gator, who molested his daughter, but he doesn't know if he did, or right. he, he says, remember. "I don't know," right? Because obviously he's such a blackout drunk. It's very clear this guy drinks like a damn fish, right? You know, he's he has to drink to get through the show. That uh, he may not, he may have done it in a blackout, but she believes it. And honestly, I, we, I, as the audience, I believe her. I think that's true. I do too. And, and I think yeah. uh, and Claudia's messed up. She's on drugs. It's obvious that something, yeah. something has bothered, and it seems like this is probably the cause. And neither of them has ever really dealt with it. And the, one of the earliest scenes is Jimmy Gator showing up to her apartment to tell her that he's dying, and she throws him out. She's yeah. just, she just can't flips, deal with it. Flips out on him. Yep. Yep. Uh, Henry Gibson. She, yeah. Oh, go ahead. That's how we, she meets another one of the major characters, John C. Riley. Yes. The, the saddest <laughs> member of the LAPD you'll ever see. He really is, because he's he totally believes, you can tell that this, I mean, we see him at one point where he's praying and crossing himself, but we can see that this is a Boy Scout. He yeah. believes in the law, the letter of the law, um, but he also does have compassion, and he is not very good at his job. You, no, um, he is in fact very bad at his job, and you can tell he's kind of a yutz. 
Mm-hmm. And he's, I mean, you notice he has no partner. No. That is, you don't do that, especially in, in the LAPD. Your protocol is you have to have a partner, but apparently nobody wants to partner with him. Yeah. And you can kind of understand when you hear him talk, the guy has really bad social skills. He thinks he doesn't. Yeah. He think, but everything he says sounds canned. I, I think, I know you don't partic- you aren't particularly fond of uh, John C. Riley, but I think he does a really good job with this character. I got tired of him. So his early career, I actually like him very much, but then I just kind of got tired of him. This here, and when he was in Boogie Nights, yeah. although he plays a fairly despicable... Well, actually, yeah. he plays... He's playing a porn actor, yeah. which I'm like, really? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he's just deluded. Um, and he's actually slightly less deluded than uh, Mark Wahlberg's character in that film, if you can believe that. Mm. Um which is also a really good film, and it was actually a toss-up which Paul uh, Thomas Anderson film I was going to choose, this or Boogie Nights, but I'm actually glad I chose this. Uh, no, he is very good at this. Uh, one of the most, the saddest, charming things is you actually hear back, they used to have it before they had computer dating, they had this sort of phone dating thing where you would call a central service and hear pitches by people about themselves, whether you wanted to send them a message or not, and you hear his. And it's basically like, Hey, I, I'm a decent guy. I'm a nice guy. I'm looking for love, and I'm looking for a, a constant relationship, and I want to be that guy for you. And it's just like, nobody picks the nice guy. Yeah. This is not going to happen. And it's 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 not that he's a bad person. He's just not confident, and he's not... And he's irritating. There's just something irritating about him. But John C. Riley does Every a great job. Every time he opens his mouth. So some of the less, not lesser actors, but the lesser roles are taken up by people like Henry Gibson, who plays this old queen, I'm sorry, but that's what he is, who is in the same bar that uh, William H. Macy characters go to, and also has a thing for this young man whose name's Brad, Um, although he's not expecting anything to come from it. Uh, No, he's just having fun flirting with him. Yes, and being a queen. And Uh, waving money at him, yeah. Louise Guzman, uh, who is playing Louise Guzman. Louise Guzman, (laughs) yep. But he's a good actor, too. He, I don't think he yeah. gets enough roles. I've liked him in, in all the roles I've seen. He has a small role in this, and he's good. Yep. Um, Michael Murphy, who I mentioned, who has a, a, a fairly, uh, I'm trying to think, like, indescribable face. Like, he's somebody yeah. you do not remember. But I saw him in this, and I'm like, wait, is that Michael Murphy? And sure he's enough, he been was. in everything, yeah. Yes, yeah. He's in the, he was in What's Up, Doc, one of my yep. favorite films. Yep. Uh, who who would I leave out? Uh... I th- let's see, I think well, the kid most- who plays Stanley is great too. I don't the, know. That's his name. true. That's one of the other subplots. Is we see the quiz show that Whiz Kid Donnie Smith was on thirty years ago, but is still going. Yeah. Which was, by the way, produced. This is the other connection. It's produced yeah. by Earl Partridge. Obviously, yep, that's a big where Earl he got Partridge production. Yeah. Yep. And uh, Jimmy Gator is has been the host for thirty years and obviously hates it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. The, you know it's. It's also a very strange quiz show. It's a you got three adults versus three kids asking answering unbelievably <laughs> difficult <laughs> questions. Yeah. I mean, good lord. I'm yeah. sitting there and th- going, I have no idea what the it's like, okay, I'm going to play you three musical notes. You transcribe them into the the letters that they correspond to and figure out what picnic food they represent. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, the one I thought was amazing cow. is like, we're going to take a piece of well-known music, and then we're going to arrange it as if it were arranged by a famous 17th <laughs> or 18th century composer, uh, and you have to tell me what the original song was, who the composer was, and what they were best known for. Or, or at one point, he's like, I'm going to recite a, lang- a lyric in English from an opera. You have to tell me, you have to recite the lyric in the original language and bonus points if you sing it. <laughs> Like, who are these people? And the thing is, this one kid, Stanley, there are three kids, and he is obviously the heavy lift. He is, if you've ever been, done, if you were ever a kid doing a team project, he's the kid who does all the work, and the other kids are just riding his coattails. Yeah. And this his- kid is a genius, and his dad is horrible. He's this very clearly yeah. unsuccessful actor, and this is his only shot, his kid. And he just, his, to him, his kid is just a, a meal ticket. Yeah, and the kid just wants to be respected and loved. And yeah. good for Stanley. Eventually, Stanley, basically, he he leaves the show. He's like, I'm not doing it, um, oh, more, God, or less, more or there's less. There's such but then, that, yeah. 
he goes off to study in the middle of the night. He breaks into a, um, a library. Uh, the school library. And this is another coincidence. While he's breaking into a library, being quiz kid Stanley whatever, quiz kid Donnie Smith is breaking into the place he got fired from to steal money from it. But he, and we'll get to this, and it has to do with the frogs, but he gets a moment where he says no. Yeah. And he goes back to home and says, you need to treat me better. Yeah, that's right. And he just he, walks into his dad's room. Dad's asleep on the bed. He goes, Dad, you need to be nicer to me. Yeah. And to the dad's credit, instead of throwing a fit, Dad just goes, go to bed. And he just yeah. says it again. You need to be nicer. Go to yeah. bed. Because if you don't, I'll end up like... Uh, um, Quiz kid Donnie Smith. Donnie Smith. But, oh, well, I was thinking of uh, uh, the, uh, the actor's name, whose name I just... Oh, William H. Macy, uh, yeah. Getting uh, old is stupid. Let me <laughs> tell you about getting old. <laughs> yeah, William H. Macy. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, and it, his little plot, we see that the two kids he's with are also fully taking advantage of him. Because whenever there's a question to be answered, the only one answers it is Stanley. And they want and, him to get up and do the final round which he doesn't want to do in one of the most agonizing sequences in that movie. And yeah. there are a lot of <laughs> sequences that are unbelievably uncomfortable and tense and awful. Stanley, who has been begging to let them to let him go to the bathroom, he pees his pants. Yep. And, and you the two feel, kids make fun of him. And you feel the, dread, the embarrassment and the shame and the humiliation, every bit of it. And Paul Thomas Anderson shoves your face in it. Look at this, he says. I'm not letting you look away. I want you to know exactly what's happening. Which I thought was just plain mean. I didn't have that big a reaction to it as you did. Mm. Um, what they don't do is when he re refuses, the two kids who know full well they can't answer anything mm. are, are forcing him to go up, and they know why he doesn't want to go up. He doesn't want to go up because everyone will see that yeah. he beat his pants. Um, I think also part of it is he that's the point where he's like, I don't want to be I don't want to be embarrassed, but I'm just tired of doing this. Yeah, I'm tired I'm, of doing what you want me to do. I'm tired of being cute. I'm not a monkey. I'm not a toy. Yeah. You think it's cute that I'm smart, but it's something to be respected. Yeah. And, and it, it should be. He's right. Um, it's it's, it's a hmm? That's just one of the plots of yeah. the film. There and are so many the, and they all twine together, you know. The, they do. Um, we see uh, William H. Macy's character, Donnie Smith, apparently got hired by this this furniture company that's constantly going out of business. Um, and this is apparently a thing, especially in Los oh, Angeles. Yeah. There's oh, yeah. I guess New York true. has And New Chicago. It it's all over yeah. the place. It's like, so we, we, all, everything must go for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, to make you think that, you know, it's these big deals. Oh, and by the way, if you hear any construction in the background, that would be uh, the new location the new headquarters of max mike movies being built so just That's ignore it right. and try to put it out of our minds this this one's going to have a roof <laughs> yeah it's supposed <sighs> to a tarp uh yeah so sorry about that so uh william h macy's character uh quiz kid donnie smith uh was hired because they thought they could use his celebrity such as it is which mm -hmm. i'm guessing after 30 years ain't much except people still recognize him well when he tells them who he is no, no, remember, like, he, oh, in, the, yeah. in the opening, he runs his car into a 7-Eleven, right. and when people run over to see if he's okay, the first thing someone says is, hey, you're whiz kid Donnie Smith. Yeah, but uh, it turns out that it's not working so well, um, because people aren't coming to the store because they want to see quiz kid Donnie Smith. And he, quiz kid Donnie Smith is not a particularly good salesman. His numbers are terrible. Uh, he's apparently borrowed money from the boss on numerous occasions and paid it back very slowly and suddenly wants to get braces for reasons nobody can understand since he doesn't need them because they don't know about Brad who's got braces at the bar. And they even say, well, how are you going to get this money? Were you going to borrow it from me? And it's like, well, well, and it's like, yeah, he, obviously he was. Yeah. Um, so they this, fire him, yeah. and he's like, he's all upset because he wants to get his braces because he thinks if he gets braces that he and Brad will have something in common and that, that Brad it'll will love him. It'll fix his life. He keeps, it's obvious, he thinks he's owed something. He thinks it, that it, his life was stolen from him. In effect, his parent, you know, his parents Gary coleman him. him. Yeah. It's an interesting point, by the way, when, at one point when he's holding forth in the bar because obviously this guy didn't drink off and he has one tequila and he gets <laughs> diarrhea of the mouth and he's talking about samuel johnson because i think uh, thurston quotes him yeah and he says you know samuel johnson wasn't a child prodigy samuel johnson didn't have his money stolen by his parents 
That is wrong, by the way. That is, in fact, exactly what happened to Samuel Johnson. One of many things. He was a child prodigy, and his parents stole all his money. And then he also uh, ended up having no money of his own, living in... in, uh, And for people who don't know, Samuel Johnson is the person that's generally uh, credited with creating the first... Um, dictionary, full dictionary of the English language. Have I got that right, Max? Yeah, he was the full, one of the first dictionaries. He was also one of the major literary critics of his time. <laughs> He's also probably best... Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I, I always get him mixed up with Ben Johnson, who, ah. who was one of the, the people who uh, criticized this hack writer named Bill Shakespeare or Shaxford <laughs> or something back in the 70s. Shack up. Shack, yeah, I, best known for that great line, Shakespeare, they say Shakespeare never blotted a line, would that he had blotted a thousand. <laughs> didn't, like, didn't like him at all. But anyway, you know, Samuel Johnson basically created the first dictionary. He was a, one of the great minds of his time. He really was a genius. And he had no money, and nope. he got a horrible disease and died of it, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So I'm not a happy guy either. Uh, but yeah, I, I totally understand you making that uh, that mistake. I often confuse uh, Roger or Francis Bacon. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who've read the book Science Made Stupid will know that very, very deep dig. Uh, yeah, yeah. And here's Ganymede as seen through a cocktail glass. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> I think so, one of the, the biggest, to me, the biggest plot point is, uh, tr- is Philip Seymour Hoffman's you know, very well-meaning, but you have to wonder if it was the right thing to do, or maybe it was, attempt, where Earl asks, he says he wants to see his son. Right. He wants to see the son he abandoned, who is Tom Cruise's character, Frank, a.k.a. Jack, and poor Philip Seymour Hoffman is trying to get a hold of him. And I, I love the way he does it. He knows who this guy is, because Frank has this empire. Let we got to talk about the character. Let's talk about Frank T.J. Mackey, shall we? Let us indeed the oh. patron saint of toxic masculinity. Oh, my God. Now, this guy, for, the saddest thing is, I remember this in the 90s. This was the beginning. This was During the 90s was a peak of what was called the men's, the new men's movement. Yeah. Yeah, and this was, this. it was also, he's kind of a mishmash of the new men's movement, which was basically massive anti-feminism. Nowadays, it's the men's right activist idiots. Mm. Uh, it was also the, the promise keeper. Basically, guys who couldn't stand the idea that traditional gender roles were changing. And I wondered that, if you were going to bring up the promise keepers. Yeah, yeah. They're, they, they came out of that, too. It's also a variation of back, what is it, 1970, I think, when this complete jerkweed named Eric Weber wrote a book called How to Pick Up Girls. Okay. And it created this culture, this it, or subculture, I really hope it's a deep subculture, <laughs> of pick up, the pickup artist. The idea that there were cues, words you could say, uh, uh, particular ways of phrasing, ways of uh, a persona you could create that would get women to have sex with you. Mm. And the idea is that is all that mattered. Not relationships, yep. not love, nothing. Get women to have sex with you. That was the whole thing. And that, and Frank Mackey takes that and he is its high priest. He's, I honestly, patron saint is what I wrote down because he yeah, really that, is. Yeah, it's like it. you have never seen toxic white male masculinity any better portrayed than in Frank T.J. Mackey's character. I, oh I my love, God. I love one of the chapter of one of his books is how to fake being a nice, caring guy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, and he has these seminars. So not only is he spouting this crap, he's charging people to hear it. And of course, who are the people who show up to these things? Mostly they're people who are not confident. Maybe they have bad self images or just haven't had luck finding somebody. And they decide that to, they're going to take this guy up because he's basically telling them it's not their fault. And they have they, a right to this. Yeah. These guys, it's and, basically what we call now incels. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that's interesting about this character is first you see the character and you're like, okay, yeah, I know this cardboard cutout because we've seen this before. Uh, And we see a bunch of his seminar and it is, it is so awful. It's called Seduce and Destroy. Yeah. And the weirdest part is that his mascot, it's a furry. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. This wolf character, yeah. and it's it's running after this cat, and I can't tell you what it says because it's we can't we'd have to bleep it. But it's like when they unfurl it, I'm like, that's an anthropomorphic. Are you a furry? I think you're a closet furry. Because yeah, you notice the cat is not. No, the wolf is an yeah. anthropomorphic uh, wolf, but the cat is a cat, yeah. and you can guess what the cat is a synonym for. Right, that's why we can't. Yeah, um, but it's just this tirade of 
And the sad thing is, is that you're watching this and you're like, I bet he's actually pretty successful. Yeah. Right? I bet he's good at this, like if in a bar, if it was Frank Mackey and they didn't know it was Frank T.J. Mackey, that he's used this and it works. And so we see this. And the really interesting part is there's these sort of these three parts to Frank Mackey. There's the first part we see at the seminar. Yeah. Then he breaks for lunch because he's, uh, you know, it's a break. People want to eat. But also he has an interview to go do on TV. And there's a TV crew there. And I, I didn't look up her name and I'm sorry I didn't. But there is this amazingly awesome character. She is this black woman reporter. And she sits down and she wants to find out more about Frank Mackey. And what is not obvious at first is that she is playing him like a fish. She totally gets Frank Mackey. And what she's not trying to do necessarily, and I, because I actually honestly believe that there is kindness in this woman. But she's like, I want to know what's really going on. So she had done some research. And she starts asking Frank about his past, and Frank gives back the, the canned answer that he's given everybody else about where he went to high school and how his mother is a librarian and that his father passed away. And she eventually comes back, and she's like, so your your mom's a librarian, your dad passed away, because, so, um, yeah, I went looking into your records, and I, I couldn't find anybody by that name at your high school. Yeah, to his amazement, it turns out she actually did research. Because he, well, one of the things is obvious that he thinks very poorly of women, mm. and... That's, well, it's clear he thinks very poorly of ma of everyone. I mean, the whole right. thing, basis of this is he doesn't believe... The whole thing is that uh, lo there's no love. He doesn't believe in love, and therefore he thinks everyone... I mean, he says at one point when he's talking about how awful men are, Yeah, he's also implying, yes, yeah, so are women. Everyone is awful to him. Everyone is horrible. He has absolutely no faith in humanity. This is a ruined person, a terribly damaged man. And we find out why through the course of the movie, which is yeah. one of the best things about the character. So slowly, and we don't do it all at once, we come back in little pieces, and as this interview grows, we find out that basically everything Frank Mackey has told people about himself is a lie. Yeah, he's constructed his entire past. He rebuilt, he made, up, made himself up. Yeah, so it turns out that, no, his dad's still alive, barely, yeah. and his mom passed away. Yeah. And that's when we find out, oh, when he was 14, he was left alone to watch his mother pass away. He was her caregiver. So my feeling is that the reason that he has no faith in humanity is that the only person who ever loved him left him alone. Or at least that's how he pictures it. And the nice thing is that they do not just come out and say that. It's all no. done through acting. It's all implied, and, and it's all done around him. Yes. You know, it's not like he's, he ever tells anyone this. He never talks about what the pain is. And poor Philip Seymour Hoffman, who thinks he's doing a good thing, is yeah. trying to find him because he's had nothing to do with his father for, what, 20, 30 years, his whole right. life, basically. Right. And he's trying to get him. There's this initially what seems like a creepy scene when uh, Hoffman is trying to order stuff to, to be delivered from the store to the house where he's taking care of Earl, and he's ordering porn. He's asking for Playboy, right. uh, Playboy Hustler, Penthouse. Uh, which, to our younger viewers, those used to be magazines that published <laughs> pictures of women with no clothes on back before, what? back when you actually had to pay money for that. Why don't we just go in and explain UHF again? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yes. Yeah, so, do we have to talk about how TVs didn't always have remotes? Um, yeah, and what the antenna's for. Yeah. 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 So, um, and, but you find out he's not he's not looking for uh, to look at uh, porn. He he knows that's where he can find. Frank's ads because of course that's where you can find Frank's ads and he gets yeah. the the number for the the uh, order hotline and somehow just through sheer dogged persistence gets put through to somebody who gets put through to somebody who finally finds Frank's assistant just to tell him yeah. look your father's dying and he asked to see you he wants to see you that was the only thing I've been able to get out of him that was coherent yeah. is he wants to see you and this you know flips out uh, uh, Julianne Moore's character, who right. just who hates Frank because he, she assumes Earl hates Frank and hates him because you know he's not around. Well, he also he threatens the life that she wants to have with her husband before he actually dies. Initially, she doesn't yeah. want Frank to have any money. She doesn't want him to profit because he left them alone and the guilt that she's got for having done what she did to Earl and so on and so forth. That's the other thing that freaks her out is when she's screaming at the lawyer that she doesn't want any of the money. She wants to be out of the will. And what will happen 
And the guy says it'll go to his nearest relative, and that's Frank, and she can't right. stand that. So she, that it's, oh God, Julianne Moore does such an amazing job in that scene as just someone who sees no way out. Her emotional range, especially like in the pharmacy, mm. when she goes in, she's going to get the prescriptions for her husband refilled, and she stops off obviously at a pharmacy she doesn't usually go to. And these are really high-end drugs, which we know some of which she's going to take yeah. herself. But these are really high-end drugs, which should raise eyebrows. Yeah, the problem one, is is that the people at the pharmacy are reacting in one of the worst ways possible. They assume that she's getting drugs for some party and she's going to take them herself and that it's it's an illegal use of them when it's like she's facing the fact... She's been told the only way to stop her husband's pain is to give him a drop of morphine. Yeah, this but is if she the does straight this, stuff. This is liquid right. morphine. This isn't the tablets. This is the pure quill. This that, is the carnation instant breakfast of yeah, morphine. Yeah. Uh, but once he has this, that all lucidity is going to be gone. He'll yeah. be put out of his pain, but there won't be any Earl left. It yeah. just will be however long it takes his body to give up. So she's facing that. And then she's facing the the insinuation that she's doing something horrible. And the way that they deal with her, which is really inappropriate, Um and then just before she leaves, she's just this whole scene of how dare you judge me? How d-? And it's, you can tell she is, and Julian Moore really, she should have gotten uh, a, a, a nomination for this too. Yeah. She goes from horrified to affronted and to furious. guilty. Yeah. And just like in, in her face, it just never stops changing because and, there's all of these emotions churned up in her and she just. She and has a momentary so, target, and even then, she can't bring herself to like go totally nuts and start throwing things. No. And so, God, and, and just a whole time, she's so lost. You can see she yeah. doesn't know how to deal with any of this. She can't deal with her feelings. She can't deal with losing her husband. No. And that's what I think leads to eventually, she does take a whole bunch of the drugs. Yes, she She agrees. overdoses, but yeah. she lives. She does. She's found, interestingly, by a young man that we met at the beginning of the film that was at a crime scene. Turns out that he is the son of the woman who committed the murder uh, <laughs> and a, a character we never seen called the Worm. Um, yeah, that was going to young... be Orlando Jones. I can't believe we missed out on an Orlando Jones performance. Oh, well. Uh, there were so many other good performances in this film. It's okay. Yeah, he actually has this little thing with John C. Riley with uh, Officer Jim, who yeah. then ends up hitting on... Uh, uh, Claudia, Claudia, who right. you know, he's responding to a noise complaint in a, I don't think it's the same neighborhood, but it's I the guess same it's, street. It's still on Magnolia. Yeah. You know? Yep. So there's uh, oh, there's two things I want to talk about, and they both have to do with John C. Riley's character, Officer Jim. So obviously, when this film was made, times were, shall we say, different. Yeah. Because the first scene we get is him, or one of the first scenes we get is him responding to this call of a complaint of yelling and screaming and other things. He is a white cop. It's L.A. You can see where I'm going with this. Yeah. And the woman's apartment he goes to, she is a black woman. So, this scene plays out very differently today than it did 20, 20 years ago. Of course. This, now, today, they would be blowing open the door with a howitzer, right. throwing, in a, throwing in a few grenades, setting up a Claymore mine perimeter, and then saying... Hi, is anybody here? But because of situations that are going on in the world today, of which we should all be aware, mm. and that Max and I have made sure there are, there are links to so you could understand that on our website, uh, we have a white cop and a black person, person of color. So there's all this tension that we're going to bring to this scene that was not initially implied. That being said... We're looking at this, and I'm sure we're all thinking, well, if that woman was white, would he have gone as far as he did? Now, as it turns out... <laughs> she does, in fact, have a dead body in the uh, closet. She does, and she didn't actually kill him. It turns out that that was killed by the worm. That being said, she knew there was a dead body. She kept lying to the cop, <laughs> Although, saying, no, there's nobody here, there's nobody here. Don't go in my, don't go in my closet. Um, <laughs> I, uh, so I, I scene... do like when he finds the body, and she just yells, that's not mine! <laughs> <laughs> so... What was originally meant to be a scene that had both tension and humor is playing Mostly very just, differently because yeah. of the times. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I even then it would have been tense. This was post yeah. O.J. Simpson. This was post yeah. the Rod Rodney King riots. LAPD in 1999 was not a shining star of law enforcement example. 
we are not looking at Adam 12. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, we are All not. emergency. No, nope, no. Nope. Um, that being said, the only thing, I mean, he forces his way in. I don't know whether he has probable cause or not. Well, I, whatever. I don't know. But it's it's a scene that is not from its creation, but because of our thankfully growing awareness problematic. Uh, the later scene that is also problematic is when he goes to a call again for uh, disturbing the peace. This time it's Claudia who's got her. This And I actually thought it was a really clever use of the soundtrack. She literally has the soundtrack turned up too loud. Yeah, the soundtrack for the movie is playing really loud in her apartment. <laughs> and she's and also an coped song. out of her mind. She is. And she can't tell or she doesn't know that it's that loud or whatever. And John C. Riley's character shows up as Officer Jim to get her to turn it down. And of course, now we have a a good um, contrast scene. So now he is at the home of a white woman. Right. And yeah. so it does. And of course, she's an attractive white woman. And now things are played differently. Now, he still makes his way into the apartment and asks the same questions. But he doesn't handcuff her to anything. Now, to be fair, she answers him the same way that the black woman did, but she's a little bit more convincing. <laughs> well, also, no, she's not as hostile. No, but, but she's also Marcy, obviously there's Marcy something was going very, on. Marcy was very angry and very hostile yeah. and was very much didn't want him to come in. For and probably Mar- good reasons other than yeah. the dead body that wasn't well, hers. <laughs> well, yeah. And also, <laughs> let's face it, Jim is being it's unbelievably ap- inappropriate because he starts hitting on her. He, want, he asks yes. her out. He you know, asks for a cup of coffee, and she, which she gives him because she's terrified. She doesn't want him to realize, you know, this house is full of drugs. Yeah. Although, here, I'm going to ask you. Do you think he knew the house was full of drugs? No, she was I think he was that clueless. Okay. I, really I was do. willing to I believe that he, he was, that he knew she was on something, but was like deciding to overlook it because he liked her. No, I think she could have had uh, white powder all over her upper <laughs> lip, and he would have just gone, oh, you've been eating a donut? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a mint donut. I mean, um, hell, his big thing later, he loses his gun. I mean, it literally yes. drops it and can't find it right. until it falls out of the sky, but we'll get there. Uh, well, no, it gets picked up by the kid. Oh, the kid picks it up. Yeah. Don't we see him do it? He wanders by, picks up. And in fact, we see the kid. He's brought out of, he was watching TV with his brothers and sisters. Yeah. The worm shows up, grabs him out of the room, and makes him go do something. What it is, I don't know. We never find out. But then out. later, for whatever reason, Officer Jim comes across uh, the worm crossing the street, and, and the worm is like, oh crap, turns around and tries to run away. Yeah. Officer and then Jim, Jim goes, goes after, after him. That's when he drops loses his gun. Loses his gum. But when he drops it, the kid picks it up and walks off with it. Oh, I don't remember that. How scene. the gun shows up later at the gas station, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But so, and we're we're gonna have to to finish this up. But yeah. um, real quick, uh, he hits on her, and they go out on a date. And yeah, she which is one of the most with awkward dates of all time. It's again, it's another one of those scenes where you're just squirming. Yeah. Because he's cause, trying to be so sweet, and he kind of is. Yep. Yeah. It's just he's not good at human it's no. just not his best he doesn't thing. quite know how to interact and she oh god she is cl- coked up out of her mind and she also just clearly is sitting there going i don't deserve a nice person i don't deserve to be treated well yeah she, and so she starts this whole thing she's like look i i want to just be flat out brutally honest because i think that if you understand who i am you're not going to like me you're going to leave and just as she's about to tell him basically i've been coked up since you met you since i met you and she, he Let's go and says, yeah, actually, I'm not confident. I'm not a good at my job. People don't like me. I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, I've been, I was divorced three years ago, and I haven't been out on a single date since then. And it's, it, it, it really diffuses the situation. And it's coming to the end of the film. And quite honestly, there's still tons more to talk about. Unfortunately, we're coming to the end. It comes to one of the brightest points in the film. That's the very last shot. And that's after all of this stuff has happened and after all they've talked about and all they've done and seen through, they've basically said to each other, let's start from scratch. Is that, and, I gotta ask you, that final sequence where Claudia's in bed and Jim has come to see her Yep. and we hear the soundtrack, are we supposed to be able to hear what he's saying? I don't think so. Okay, because I, I couldn't. Yeah, yeah, it's probably like one of those uh, lost in translation moments. Yeah, and it's uh, just he's but, talking to her and then there's the one of the stranger moments because she just... The last shot is she turns and looks right at the camera. And she the smiles. Only, the only person in the movie who's done that. I Yeah, that was I didn't like that. I did, because <laughs> what it did was it told me, I think these two actually are going to be okay. 
Mm, maybe. I think they're going to be good for each other, and I think there's hope. And that's one of the things I like. And that scene, that one image of her smiling, that's what started the whole movie. That's He built the whole movie around that. Uh. So, but yeah, tons more to talk about, not least of which is the other performances. They're so good. If you like actors' movies, this is a movie because for you because there is nobody bad and some people stunningly good in this. And again, Tom Cruise, we can't say enough good about, I can't believe I'm saying this, but he really flexes himself as an actor. He's really vulnerable. There's a scene where he breaks down because he's like, I'm not going to cry for you when his father's dying. Because he actually goes to his father's deathbed. He finally agrees to do it. Again, in an absolutely brilliant sequence because he's still being the a-hole that he is. When he walks in, the the Earl has a whole bunch of dogs and he's looking at at, uh, uh, Phil, the nurse, saying, Phil, I will effing drop kick these dogs if they come near me yeah. he says that twice like okay yeah you're still not a good person but he goes over and he, he and his father sees him and he tries to say something and if he yeah. if we were supposed to understand that i couldn't hear it no no it's just supposed to be mumbled but, stuff. but you but, know that he sees him and that he knows yep. that he's there and watching him fight his own emotions fight his he doesn't want to cry he doesn't want he says i will not cry for you you bastard Yep, and he does, and, and he's not. He boy does he. Oh, and you can see is, Hoffman in the background. I mean, Philip Seymour Hoffman. You can see he's crying. He loses yeah. it too. Yep, and it's because partially because he didn't know Tom Cruise was yeah. like actually going to act. <laughs> um, but the third part, we talked about there being three parts to Frank T. J. Mackey's character. So the first part is, you know, we see him at his show. The second part we see in the interview as this woman slowly peels back the layers, yeah. and we see him just. The boil, you see, it's like, I'm at 200, I'm at 205, I'm at 210, and finally he just shuts down. Yeah. Because she basically comes out and says, I, she doesn't, she's not brutal about it, but she basically comes out and says, I know exactly who you are. It is kind of ambush journalism. It's, it is. It's na- it's it's not but, very nice, but let's face it, he friggin' deserves it. He does, because he's somebody who's espousing this this theory of what should be, and it's like, well, you're a total lie. Yeah, everything, but you're then a complete the third fraud. Part is, yeah. The third part of, of him, which ends in him falling apart in front of his dad, yeah. is he goes back to the seminar. And the interesting thing, and I, again, I got to give Tom Cruise credit, when he's back on stage, we see him mentally trying to convince himself of his own crap. And we know he's not buying it as what, the way he did before. And now we know where it comes from. We know that everybody in his life abandoned him, or at least that's how we see it. His mother yeah. dying was abandoning him. So we get it. We totally get it. And of all the characters in the film, his and Claudia's, I, and, well, and Stanley, we get Stanley too. Yeah. And it's there's some really great showing, not telling. I um, think we get some film. of that with with both Donnie and Jim as well. Jim decides he want he's willing to take a chance and try to lo- yep. to care about someone. And Donnie, who has this moment of conscience after the after trying to steal from his boss and says, "No, this is stupid. I don't know what I'm, I'm yeah. going to." And he goes back and tries to put it back. And then frogs fall out of the sky. Frogs fall. And then yeah. what do we get? We get Stanley, who looks who looks up from what he's reading and says. These things sometimes happen. Yeah, because he's and reading that's Charles the point Fort. Of the he's reading all the weird yep. books. And he's like, huh, how about that? Everyone else is like, what in God's name is happening? Because like a metric ton of frogs. And yes, this is a real phenomenon. Tornadoes yep. sometimes go over lakes and suck up the entire amphibian population and drop them on people. Yep. And places. Now, I think that it's probably not quite as many frogs. No, as in this film, I don't quite think as not so. Not widespread, but that was a lot of frog. It <laughs> was. But what it what does it mean to me? What it means is it is a moment for all of these characters to get a bucket of water in the face and stand back and go, "Wait, what the hell is going on?" Not just with the frogs, but with their lives. And the interesting part is that not every character says, "Oh, I've been really screwing up my life." quiz kid donnie smith i should change what i'm doing some of the characters just keep on doing what they're doing yeah and that's all they're and we don't know what's going to happen with frank tj Mackey. we see him lose it is that going to lead to anything or not we don't we have no know idea. we have no idea we don't know also we don't really know what happens with jimmy gator he's ready to we, shoot himself in the head yep and then a frog falls through the skylight knocks the gun out of the way <laughs> it fires hits something and it starts a house fire yeah and we may well, does he die in that we don't know we don't. So the frogs, which is the most bizarre part of this movie, is literally just a moment of 
suddenly something that is so weird and outside your experience yeah. happens in a flash that you've got no moment to process it and instead have a moment to process everything else. Yeah, but, it's, it's a slap in the face. It forces yeah. every, or it tries to force every character out of their own heads. To and see speaking the, of for, forcing us out of our own heads, we yeah. have to finish yep, up we as, do. as much as, as, as fun as it's been. So, <laughs> the roundup. Max. Yeah. I already know, but the audience doesn't. What do you think of this film? Uh, I think this is uh, a phenomenal amount. The acting in this film is phenomenal. Uh, I do not think it's a great film. Okay. I think I think it is a bit, I think it's kind of pretentious. I think it's a little self-important. And I think it's incredibly indulgent on the part of the director. Because he had free reign and he basically obviously said, I'm going to just do something I think is cool. Okay, and he did not really uh, consider. I don't think he considers the audience, and I think you kind of have to do that a little. Again, that said, there are amazing parts to this movie, and if you have a day and a half, I recommend you know. <laughs> you know oh yeah, yeah, we left that part out. Yeah, it's uh, this three, film is hours over three hours and eight <laughs> minutes. Three hours. This is longer than Titanic, yeah. which has the word Titanic in its title. This yeah. is three hours long, and I tell you, this film could have been edited. I think it, even the director himself, when they asked yes, him he if did. he would change, he said, I could have made it shorter. This movie is yeah. brutally long. He did say, well, this was later on, he said he would take out about 20 minutes, which honestly <laughs> doesn't make it <laughs> that much that shorter. Much. Again, there are amazing things in it. It's also an unbelievably difficult movie to watch. It is painful. It is tense. It makes you very uncomfortable. In that way, if that's what he was going for, he succeeds. Because he definitely gets an emotional response. You cannot ignore this movie. I can't believe anyone walked out of this movie going, eh, didn't do anything. But I can't say I enjoy it. What about you? I know that you love this thing. I really do like this film. Uh, one of the things that I think works very well, and this is very much in the director's favor, is, yeah, it's three hours and eight minutes. It's very well paced. I never wasn't interested. And even the characters who are terrible people you're still interested in them. They're still interesting. You want to know what's going on. Frank T.J. Mackey, could he somehow have a turnaround and have some sort of redemption? Actually, maybe. Would he have to do a hell of a lot to do it? Oh, yeah. I mean, he'd have to go basically on the same circuit, find everybody he took money from, and tell them personally, yeah, all that stuff I said was terrible. Women are great. You should not treat them like that. Um, but he could. And that's, I think, a real strength of... Because he also wrote this film. Yeah. This is a real strength of, of Paul Thomas Anderson, is that the writing is excellent. The, the performances are stunning. The pacing is really good. I really like this film. When I first watched it with Max, I didn't understand how Max was going to see it. Max thought it was one of the most depressing things he'd ever saw. Mm. And for some reason, I don't see it that way. I'm not saying it's not a depressing film, but I was not depressed by watching it. Um, it is not a film for everybody. Um, it is in a way, maybe the pinnacle of the 90s indie film moment, partially because he was given all this money and said, I better just run with it because I'll never get to do this again. It really is I, remarkable in just what he did. This is a movie no one would make today. No. It would no. not get released. It's This is a very daring, challenging movie. I will, I will absolutely say that. Yeah. Uh, was he indulgent? Potentially. Yeah. I won't disagree with Max on that. Max does not enjoy it as the as a film. I totally respect that. I can see why other people wouldn't enjoy it. But I think that one of the reasons I like it is that it's a challenging film and that it doesn't just let you sit there with your mouth open, right? It does require you to keep these connections and wonder what the heck is going on and why they're going on. Um there's a scene in there's a couple of scenes in the film that I'm sure people were like, why is this doesn't work? One of them is the frogs, but I get the frogs. I totally get the frogs. The other is there's one scene where at one moment, and oh, it's the yeah, moment of so synchronicity weird. that sun there's an Amy Man song playing that every single character is singing to. The interesting part about it, and it's very surreal, is that the line that they're singing has to do with that particular character. Yeah, yeah, don't we don't have time to go through each one, but you're no, right. And that's fine. And I can easily see people saying this does this is a weird, unnecessary, surrealistic moment. I don't know why this is here. I, th I, I had a problem with that the first time I saw it. It took me yeah. out of the film. It really did. Um, and I totally see why it would. I loved that. 
there's actually some other quoting of Amy Mann, which is not at all um, obvious. So at one point, yeah. when Claudia and Jim have come back from their date, she says to him, now that I've met you, would you object to never seeing each other again? Which is from <laughs> one of the songs on the soundtrack called Deathly. Um, and I knew it because I know the song really well. I've sung it many times. So this is, uh, you know, this is a divisive film. Max would be really happy if he never had to watch it again. I really and, would. And I would not watch it once a year, but every once in a while I'd go back, and I was really glad I re rewatched this because it's just an, a really interesting, amazing film. And again, Tom Cruise proves that he can actually act if he wants to when he doesn't have to be saving the world. Yeah, no, he, um, this, I, I will I, agree. I, this is, I think, one of the great, this is the best thing I've seen Tom Cruise in. Yeah, and nobody's bad, and everybody has d different variances of amazing. So, but yeah. next week, I think we should have, uh, well, I don't get to decide, but I, I'm guessing we should have something that will contrast in some yeah, I thought way. We'd, we'd have in some... what way? Well, I, th <laughs> I thought we'd have something more lighthearted, like, you know, Showa or The Sorrow and the uh, Pity, or maybe or, Schindler's, uh, Schindler's List. list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You no, know, they're making I... a musical. No, they're not. Yeah, no, I, God, I hope not. It's just called Schindler with an exclamation <laughs> oh, point. Lord. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure somewhere someone is going, you know. <laughs> uh, no, we, we are going to do something li a little more lighthearted. This is something else that came out of the 90s, and that was The Rise of Pixar. Mm, Pixar, Pixar. Yeah. No, I don't know it. Yeah, yeah. There's this, this obscure little indie animation house. Actually, they, they kind of were. Huh? <laughs> did they make chicken run thing? Huh? Did they make that chicken run thing? No, no, that was somebody no. else. Oh. No, no, we're talking about Toy Story, the first major Pixar release. Mm, the thing that it. started the empire of Pixar. And, mm. you know, as... I I see myself as Woody to Mike's, well, I don't know, he, I guess probably Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to Mr. Potato Head you. <laughs> yeah. Toy, no, I never saw it or Toy Story 2 or Toy Story 3 or uh -huh. Toy Story Toy 4. Story 4. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Toy Story, which actually, if you think about it, is a genuine existential horror movie that tells you that your toys are sentient beings who come to life when you're asleep. <laughs> Or oh, it's just a vehicle for Don Rickles, you hockey puck. <laughs> This has been a co-production of The Voice of Max and The Movie Wrench.